So I'm Eve Behar. I'm the founder of Fuse Project. It's a design, branding, and strategy agency in San Francisco. And I will share a few things that we have, um, we have been working on in the last five years. And as a way, I will show you how we are working for on the next five years. So this is a little bit the 40,000 40, feet view um, on a flight to, um, to uh, China. Um, and it's dreamy and mesmerizing up there. And it's easy to make these sort of long-term predictions um, that are dreamy and mesmerizing. Um, but we are very anchored in the making of dreams, in the, um, in the, in the building, in the researching, and in the producing of actual, um, of actual products. So we live in between this 40,000 feet view and, and the everyday reality. In uh, res researching 2012, um, though, the news are not so good, it seems. Um, the population will reach 7, million, 7 billion. Uh, more glaciers will, will have melted. Uh, more spe species will, have, uh, will be extinct. Um, and then I also read that the Mayan calendar ends December 2012. I don't know if it had anything to do with, with the date that we picked here. Um, they really thought this was going to be the end of the world. And then for me, um, well, maybe the worst part is apparently I'll be five pounds heavier in 2012. That's according to uh, U.S. statistical data. We do gain an extra 10 pounds for every 10 years or so. So there's, there's a lot of power in pessimism, obviously, and it does get our attention, um, and it does get great media coverage as well. Uh, and... The nature of our work, though, is really optimistic. Um, you know, we anticipate change. We look at te technological change. We look at social change. Um, we look at big issues. And all of that information allows us to see around corners, um, you know, to work today on what is said to be impossible, um, but that is very much possible tomorrow. Um, and so when I was a kid, I watched this, um, this cartoon called The Baba Papas. And this cartoon was all about transformation, how things, this, this very cute family um, was sort of transforming themselves into these new shapes. This was created by a couple, a French and Japanese couple. Um, let me see. And um, has anybody seen this? Good. <laughs> it's the best. I mean, they, they, they sort of change themselves. They, they're able to sort of use their, their bodies. Um, to solve problems, to have fun together. Um, <clears throat> it's, just, it's just fantastic. <laughs> so I would say, you know, the, the, the Fuse Project designers live in this optimistic um, space, but we're steeped in technical realities. Um, and we organize around two main themes. One is the human emotion, the experience, and the other one is the notion of the, the democratization of design. Um, and I will, I will walk you through a couple, a couple of these things. I will show three project, projects. Um, and, and these projects are about how we sort of play and how we experimental and how part of our work is always, I would say, laboratory work. It's always experimental work. And then how that laboratory work really sort of becomes reality. Uh, uh, becomes reality in some of the products that we have here. So the first uh, project here is actually something we presented a couple of weeks ago in Milan. Um, this is a project for Swarovski. Swarovski is the largest producer of crystals in the world. Um, and they, you know, it's a, it's a $2 billion company or more, um, you know, just making crystals. This material, which until a few years ago was really seen as old-fashioned, um, backwards um, and, uh, and very rigid, really. I mean, you buy a chandelier, you put it up in a room, and five, five years, 50 years later, it is exactly the same thing. So Morpheus, this concept there, is, um, is all about change and transformation, a little bit like the Barba Papas, in fact. Um, and it is, and I, I wanted it to be programmable in a sense that I wanted people to sort of change it themselves to sort of, um, so we actually even created a, um, a piece of software and a drawing program on a tablet. So you can essentially create your own forms 
and the whole piece will morph, transform slowly to that, um, to that shape. So it's really about making a material like crystal, which is hard, rigid, um, static, into something that is in movement, something that is um, you know, mesmerizing uh, because of suddenly it's made soft. You know, it's very unexpected. Um, and it was mesmerizing. It is very much like watching a jellyfish sort of constantly move and change and transform. Another project that we, have, um, we had experimented with with the same company, Swarovski again, uh, three years ago is called Voyage, and it's a giant 15 feet wide, 50,000 crystals, 2,000 LED um, constructed piece of sculpture. And um, what, I, what I was looking for there and I was, what I was trying to learn is how to really create an emotional um, uh, experience based on the LEDs that would be moving, there would be motion, there, there's motion sensors, and the light sort of tends to move with you as you're sort of walking by this wave of, um, of, of crystal. And this is the first time I started thinking and developing this notion of light shifting and motion sensors um, uh, and whatnot. So, you know, the, the, the sort of sculptural qualities are one that you can see in an image right here, but it's really the experience that, um, that, um, that made it uh, quite an emotional presentation. So about five years ago, Herman Miller, um, the leader in, in uh, contract furniture and the world came to us and they were like, well, you guys are doing some interesting stuff. Let's give you a very small project. And, um, it was small, but we sort of captured the, the, the possibilities, the realm of possibilities there. It was about thinking about lighting, thinking about a task light. And very much like I think it had been done 10, 12 years ago with, with, with the chairs, um, there was an opportunity, I felt, to really rethink the task light. And one thing that I was particularly interested in is how our lives are different today. Our lives are all about change and transformation. We're in our homes. We're typing on the computer, we have Wi-Fi, we're on our cell phones. Work, life, it's all sort of coming into one place. That means the products that we use have to have this ability to adapt, to change, to transform, and to match the kind of lives, the kind of emotions we're in at that particular point. So in this case, light shifting, being able to change the light, essentially to make it your own, was, um, was a main purpose. So LEAF came about. It took five years. Um, and this light is all about the ability to change the coloration of the light. I mean, there is a, there is a very sort of dramatic sculptural element to it. Of course, it can change sizes, and it can, it can sort of be a uh, wall reflector, and it can be a, a mood light. But most importantly, what I wanted to do is allow for somebody to shift the coloration of the light. So we mixed LEDs, warm LEDs and cold LEDs, and allowed these LEDs to sort of mix. And so there is a sensor here that allows you to make that change. Um, and that interaction also, for me, has to be always magical with the products we work on. So the interaction was just done by the touch. You just touch the surface here. And it's a little bit like a DJ mixing records. On one side, it's the brightness. On the other, it's the color for warm, from warm to cool. And there's a lot of technology behind this. Um, there's a lot of um, complexity behind, behind these projects. Um, in, you, know, in, you can see here the whole sort of interface is quite complex. But for me, technology has to be done with this notion of humanity. And I call it technology with humanity in a sense that it becomes so simple, there's, there's, you know, like five seconds of learning here. But once you know how to use it, it becomes intuitive and easy. Um, and it is also universal in the sense that anybody can really just touch the surface and change it, whether you have um, full tactility um, or not. One of the main challenges with it, though, was uh, LEDs themselves. Heat um, that is produced by the LEDs is actually quite... Uh, quite important. And so we would turn these on, um, prototypes of these about two years ago, and they would essentially burn up within, within a minute. Uh, they would get so warm, so hot that um, they would burn up. Um, this meant that we, we had to really sort of think about the entire product. Uh, we had to think of the light bulb, 
and the light. I mean, it's very rare that as a designer you design the light bulb and the light. Um, and in this case, the light bulb, the, the entire light had to be a heat sink, meaning it had to dissipate heat from the, from the top of the, um, of, the, of the lights themselves all the way through the body. So it is made out of aluminum, formed aluminum, and the entire product is essentially a heat sink, which meant that we went so far with it that you can actually touch it. You can grab onto it. And uh, as, as you know, you don't have to tell your kids not to, not to touch the light bulbs anymore. And so this is where design and sort of the, the, the original concept really comes all together. And I think this is where design doesn't stop. It continues into some of these notions, you know, were just fun slogans we had come up with, like touch the lights while designing this product. But they became a part of um, the promotion of the product, the booth. The, you know, the, it's all about integration today. And it's all about all these parts are integrated into, into, into one sort of final experience. So the other, pa the other place that is, um, that is really interesting to me right now, and that's going to happen a lot more over the next five years, I'd certainly hope so, is this notion of uh, democratize, democratization um, that design can bring. Um, designers are finally being used to solve important problems. Um, and we, we're, you know, we train this way. We train to sort of bring together communication and, and, and form and function and technology into, into new spaces. So we're working on a few projects, which I call civics projects. Um, and one of which we, which we have here is the One Laptop Per Child. This is an incredible project that Nicholas Negroponte um, uh, engaged us in about two years ago. And um, this is, just to summarize, a project where we're making um, millions of laptops for the developing world. And these the countries that are partnering with us give them away to their kids in schools. Um, and we're producing them at a very, very low cost. Um, the initial 5 million units are going to, going to be between $150 and $175. And after this, we want to bring the price down to about $100 a piece. But when, when Nicholas came to me, he said, you know, this project is about three things, three passions, two of which I've been able to, to, to focus my life on. One is education, as the chairman of MIT uh, and the Media Lab. One is technology. Obviously, he was, he's, in, he's in that space. Um, and the third one is design. And the question is, you know, why design? Why, the, why is design important here? A few months ago, there's a journalist from Switzerland that called me, and she she asked me this question, you know, what, you know, why why is design important in this project? Why is design something that you need to think about um, on a project for the developing world? Um, and I was like, I was I start, I was so much shocked by the by the question, but I didn't really understand. She was saying, isn't design a bit of a superficial super, superficial? Uh, isn't it about aesthetics? Um, isn't it something you just a bit of an add-on and not needed there? And I was like, you know, actually, design is a basic human need. Quality, um, texture, good, good information, good technology, that is universally understood anywhere we go, whether it's here in New York or whether it's in Nigeria where these computers are. So... Four, five core ideas. When he came to me, the, this, this, I, I sort of wrote this little poem about it because I was so emotional and I thought it was the greatest project that I had, had ever come through the door here. And um, so it was plant an idea, how you start something, and how that something, uh, as outlandish as it might sound three years ago or four years ago, um, how today actually it has many imitators and many people who are participating in this, and I think that's a good thing. Seed learning grow a mind, mind the world, and share. Now, share is not just about us sharing with them. It's also about the ability for the kids to share together, to sort of um, get closer together. So what, what, what's in this laptop are these cute Wi-Fi antennas. Um, these have a half a mile radius, which means that the kids can connect together. They, it creates a mesh network. So just imagine, they go home, 
um, after, after school, they open the laptop, and they're able to speak to each other. There's a video camera, and there's a microphone, and they can speak to each other. They can email to each other. The entire village becomes Wi-Fi enabled as, as soon as they come home. So there's, there's power in, um, in quantity here. So, and, uh, but we had to make this project very, um, very cost effective. And the, um, so every part in the laptop has multifunction. The antennas, for example, um, are also the cover to the ports to protect them from, um, from dust and dirt. Um, they're also a latch, which locks down, allows the, 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 the computer to close. And um, they're also part of the bumper, the protection around the laptop. Um, but there's so much to say about this. The interfaces are different. Um, we have a, the widest trackpad ever made so the kids can learn script writing. Uh, the keyboard is completely sealed with rubber. Uh, we went all the way down to the texture, to the way you know, things are felt, not just the way they look six feet away. And um, also attach, uh, allowed for some attaching points um, for local craft and local um, uh, sort of, you know, for the product to be really sort of owned by the people who, who have it. And then finally, one way to, make the, to bring the cost down is to use a, a different type of processor and to use software that is less heavy. Um, but in some cases, we need alternative power. And this is a, a prototype, pre-manufacturing prototype, that shows you human power. In the places where when the kids come home and there's no electricity, uh, we worked um, with a company based in Alameda uh, called Squid Labs on this uh, human power device. We call it the yo-yo power. So by push pulling on this for, for a few minutes, you charge the laptop. And we also gonna, we want it to be fun, so there is software that's being created um, so the kids can compete against each other and like turn you know, power generation into, into, um, into something exciting. So there are lights in here, and I'll just go. And this is my version of the Barba Papa, the sort of transforming, doing everything um, uh, laptop. So these are right now in testing in a few places, Nigeria, Argentina, Brazil, um, uh, Libya, and um, it's, it's going to be a very exciting adventure. So in closing, I'll be short. I think designers have a responsibility to show the world the way we want it to be, to show the future, since we have this ability to imagine things moving forward and to move beyond the status quo. And um, I have two things that I think need to be worked on. Um, in fact, I would love to do it myself, but if anybody else does it, I would love it too, which is, can somebody design a better looking hybrid car? Please. Because <laughs> I love the technology, but I'm not going to get into one yet. <laughs> and also more comfortable, smarter air travel. This is, we, it seems like we've gone back and we should definitely do this before um, before the Mayan end of the world. I was fascinated when I was reading about your work. Um, you define it as storytelling. And I think that for many of us here, that is our work too in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of every narrative, there's an emotion. Um, but how, how did the, the visual emotion or the visceral emotion in an object relate to the, the, the emotion that you can convey in language? And is, is the, because you wanted to be a writer also when you started out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to know about that relation. Well, I think, I think it's the integration of all the pieces. I mean, there's a visual language. There is um, a sinuous, continuous, you know, form, for example, in the leaf light, which in a way very much expresses the thinness of the LEDs, you know, the fact that we wanted to, the technology to look like something new and different. Um, and it looks like a leaf, it looks like something natural, so that expresses also the fact that it consumes 40% less energy than compact fluorescent. It's about bringing all the little pieces together into, into you know, a very clear narrative, a very clear story. And in a way, the experience has to have its surprises, like a story does. Um, the experience has to have a beginning and an end. Um, it's, it's, it's about the designer 
not just as a form maker or as a surface maker, but really as somebody who, um, who will integrate all the pieces, um, all the pieces of this puzzle. Your stories are wonderfully upbeat. It was sort of, you, you, you were talking about um, pessimism, the power of pessimism, and I, do, I want to sort of keep it at bay, but, but I'm, I'm interested to know uh, in the democratization of good design and the, the, the search for solutions and this sort of wonderful spirit of play, in, in experience, in our visual experience of the world is that democratization brings ugliness, conformity, uh, um, yes, cheapness in some ways, and yes, uh, reaching out to other parts of the world. Well, how, do you, how do you deal with that, and how, what's your solution to that or your proposal? Well, I started working on children's products about a year and a half ago, and a child psychologist told me that the earlier you, you um, confront children with quality, with, um, you know, tactile experiences, with, with, with things of value, the, the more they'll seek it later in life. And in a way, you know, design, like everything else, is a giant educational project um, that, we, that we sort of take on every day. The more people get sophisticated about how things are, how they work, but also where they come from, their sustainability, um, you know, how they treat people, how, you know, products really treat people in certain ways. And I think the earlier um, you, you, you bring those qualities to, um, to, to, to people, the better. So um, that's, that's part of the work. Um, I also, there was a, there was a wonderful line in, in, in Walter Benjamin about the story being the tutor of mankind. And it really mm. is so much... Uh, is very much the, the sort of the project of, the, of, the, of this work that you're doing. Um, how do people talk back to you? Is there, this is, I know this is a notion of uh, what kind of feedback do you get? How, do, how does the collaboration work? Because what is it that's a greyhound designed by a committee with some sort of hideous animal? Um, right, that is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think I'm, I'm, our work is done very much in, collaborative, in a collaborative spirit. If you come to our office, we have... Uh, 27, 28 uh, designers in the office. We all work around the same three tables. We all work together. Um, strategists, graphic designers, packaging designers, industrial designers, design engineers are all sort of mixed in into the same space. So, so collaboration within, within our office, but also with our, um, you know, with, with, with the people that engage us. I mean, with Nicholas, I get five emails a day from him mm -hmm. about little details, even though it's finished. It's not really finished. There's still things that we're improving. Um, so it's a lot about collaboration. It's a lot about um, watching the idiosyncrasies of people's behavior. It's the little things that we do wrong every day, all the time, because this knob or this... Um, computer or the, you know it's 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 a lot of observation and I think you have to have a lot of empathy and you have to also be amused by and be interested and and, and find that um, the inspiration in the idiosyncrasies of our behavior for you know different um, you know dif for, for for essentially creating different different experiences there how do you deal with the corporate culture of some of your clients I mean certainly some are very adventurous and others are are, are, are sort of large entities with, yeah. with a high, presumably hierarchical structure. Right. How does that work? <clears throat> well, that's, the, that's sort of the battlefront of, of every day. And, and I say battlefront, I mean, I, I love battle, so it's not like all negative. Um, but I think, I think there's still a lot of, um, a lot of that, that corporations have to learn from us. And in many ways, it's, it's up to us to, to make, you know, to, to, to walk them through the process, to walk them through experimentation. I mean, Swarovski, this large company, just giving, um, you know, millions of dollars, really, to, like, many designers. I'm not the only one doing this, um, to experiment with their material, sort of open-ended, you know, let, let them explore the world. And I think we're missing, what we're missing right now is patrons, patrons of design, patrons of experimentation. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think in many ways architects have, have found patrons. Um, but I don't think designers have really found true patrons yet. And um, so w we need to sort of show them that what seems maybe chaotic or risky, ha you know, gets sort of tremendous, uh, tremendous rewards. 
I tend to work with my clients as a partner. So I tend to be brought on sometimes as an advisor, sometimes as uh, somebody that will give them feedback on a lot more than just a design problem, um, on the entire experience of their company. And I think the more that is integrated, the more we sort of, it's not a client slash um, uh, design relationship, it's much more an integrated relationship, the more we get, we're, we're able to make uh, fast progress. Um, I was very interested to read that you uh, like the idea, I love this idea, of a cell phone for dummies, otherwise known as a stupid cell phone. The, not the idea of, of smart machines, but of stupid machines, which are in fact um, adapted to people who are fearful or, or right. whatever. Everything should be stupid. Stupid yes. smart, though. Um, <laughs> and, and it's a little bit like, you know, it's a little bit like minimalism in a sense that, that the more it's simple, the harder it is to make, the harder it is actually to figure out these interactions, these experiences, for them to be intuitive and simple. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's a lot more work than sometimes um, people are willing to take on. Well, it's a very, uh, I think, Zen notion, the idea of letting the inessential go, and mm -hmm. the point at which you have to give yourself permission to do that. You have to sort of, in a way, discipline yourself to be able to do that. And it's a very sure. beautiful idea. You're a good person to do this. How do you uh, confront the fear of change, especially in an older generation, which feels this horrible pace of obsolescence, mm -hmm. so that every time, you know, every, with every new turnover, there's another challenge that's insuperable. What, what can you do about that? Well, I think as designers, our responsibility is to make these things, um, these products. I mean, my, my father was, was in Milan, and he wanted to photograph the Morpheus, and he couldn't figure out the, the photography feature, the photo feature on his cell phone. And that could be so simple. I mean, that is such a, you know, it's natural. People want to do it. I mean, you know, my parents, who were very technology-averse, love the fact that I can send them pictures and that I can receive pictures from them on an instant basis. They love that. That's, that's easy. That's an easy sell. It's how you do it. And in that way, you know, I think when I talk about the 40,000 feet versus the six feet and the six inches um, of the experience, I think we need to sort of focus so much of our work on, on the close in, on the, on the real, um, the, the way things, so, you know, are made and are, are, are produced and are resolved. And I think so often, you know, the software is done over here and the hardware is done over there and, and it's just a mishmash, it's put together and nobody really wants to make the hard work. I mean, the important thing is concentrate on, concentrate on the important work and the hard work, which is sometimes invisible. But when it gets to people, that's, that's the magical part of the experience. Well, I wish we had time to ask my next question, which we don't, which is about the fashion world, which you know very well, having had a fashion company and working with some wonderful avant-garde designers. We'll have to save it for next year. Thank you very we much. Will. Thank you. Thank you.